Welcome back everyone and thank you very much for joining us again today. I'm here with, of course, the Illinois Department of Public Health Director, Dr. Ngozi Azike, and we're joined today by Illinois State Treasurer, Michael Frerichs, by our Director of the Department of Revenue, David Harris, and by Michael Jacobson, the President of the Illinois Hotel and Lodging Association. Our state controller, Susana Mendoza, was unable to join us. She's caring for her elderly mother, and both are doing well, but adhering to my order to stay at home. As this crisis has evolved, my team and I have worked to protect our residents, our workers, and our small businesses as they navigate this extremely challenging time. To keep people from losing their homes, Last week, I suspended residential evictions in every county in Illinois. And I also directed additional resources to organizations across the state that protect our homeless population by providing food and shelter. I ordered a moratorium on utility shutoffs for residents who can't pay their bills during this period. I expanded and cut the red tape for state unemployment eligibility for those impacted by COVID-19. I waived late filing fees and interest on sales tax payments to give more than 24,000 bars and restaurants statewide a two-month reprieve. And we ensured that Illinois small businesses from every county are eligible for coronavirus disaster assistance loans of up to $2 million. In addition to those measures, today I am proud to announce an important new measure to support our residents and most small businesses and to soften the immediate economic impact of this moment. Illinois will delay our tax filing deadline from April 15th to July 15th, aligning our tax day with the federal governments and giving our millions of taxpayers three additional months to file their individual returns. Refunds will continue to be distributed in a timely fashion. There's more. My office and the Department of Commerce and Economic Opportunity are working closely to find ways to expeditiously direct our existing small business programs to those experiencing the greatest need. By Friday, our small businesses will be eligible for a share of $90 million in state emergency assistance through three new programs. First, all of our small businesses outside of Chicago, that's businesses with fewer than 50 employees and under $3 million in 2019 revenue in every industry are eligible for our new $60 million Illinois Small Business Emergency Loan Fund, allowing up to $50,000 loans with five-year low interest repayment terms. Required loan payments won't begin for six months offering crucial time for business owners to begin recovering from the economic impact of COVID-19. DCEO, the Department of Commerce and Economic Opportunity, in partnership with our Illinois Department of Financial and Professional Regulation, has established a loan loss reserve of $20 million to back up the financing provided by our state chartered banks. I wanna thank the Illinois Bankers Association and the Community Bankers Alliance for their partnership in launching this program. Acción, a global leader in nonprofit microfinance, will help administer this program and assist applicants through this process. And applications will be available by the end of the week on the DCEO website and also on our main coronavirus website at coronavirus.illinois.gov. Our second small business program also focuses on our suburban and downstate communities, specifically on areas with low to moderate income populations. We're launching a $20 million downstate small business stabilization program, which will provide emergency grants of up to $25,000. These are grants of $25,000 to small businesses that are being served by DCEO's Office of Community Development. And lastly, our hospitality businesses have experienced some of the most significant hardships during this crisis. To help address the significant challenges of our bars and restaurants and small hotel companies, D 
DCEO retooled existing funds to offer support to our state's hospitality industry through this crisis. Our new hospitality emergency grant program will offer $14 million to help hotels, bars, and restaurants support their payroll and rent, as well as job training and technology for operations like pickup and delivery, which for now have become central to many restaurants staying open. These grant applications are live starting today and can be found online again at coronavirus.illinois.gov or on DCEO's website. Hospitality industries, hospitality businesses in every corner of our state are eligible to apply. And the IHLA president, Michael Jacobson, who has also been an incredible partner to our Illinois Emergency Management Agency in reviewing hotels for possible emergency use, We'll talk more about the importance of these programs and how you can become eligible or apply for them in just a few moments. In addition to these new small business supports, my team has been working hard on behalf of business owners and homeowners to work with private entities that are beyond the state's authority to make sure that we're alleviating some of the financial stresses that people are encountering. My Department of Commerce and Economic Opportunity Director and I are asking all the banks that administer Advantage Illinois loans, which support hundreds of small businesses throughout the state, to modify their loan structures through either a three-month deferral of payments or six months of interest-only payments. DCEO has pre-approved all such modifications in order to fast-track those benefits to our residents as quickly as possible. For homeowners, we've heard a lot from people asking for mortgage assistance, mortgage assistance. Across Illinois and across the nation, mortgages are owned by the federal government or institutions like Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac, as well as others. I've asked each of those federal institutions to offer all borrowers multi-month forbearance to reduce the strains of this period and offer millions of Americans financial relief. They've offered this, not only to Illinoisans now, but to qualified mortgage holders nationwide. Please contact your mortgage servicer or Fannie Mae directly for more information. On a similar note, we've sent letters to the three national credit bureaus, asking them not to punish people's credit ratings for the instabilities of our time. The enduring impacts of COVID-19 on Illinoisans' lives and livelihoods will be significant. So we must take every action possible to help people all across our state. I wanna talk for a moment about the federal relief bill. Overnight, Democrats and Republicans working together in Washington struck a deal on a $2 trillion rescue package with the Senate set to vote today. For days, I've been speaking directly with Senators Durbin and Duckworth and a half a dozen of our nation's governors, as well as Senate Minority Leader Chuck Schumer and members of House Speaker Nancy, Nancy Pelosi's staff about how best to serve our small businesses and working families here in Illinois. Critically important to working families across our state, this deal provides a direct payment of $1,200 to every American worker who makes under $75,000 annually, with a phase up, a phase out up to annual salaries of $99,000. Families will also receive an additional $500 per child. This agreement is also slated to significantly extend federal unemployment, both in benefits and in length of time, including expanding the program to include independent contractors freelancers and gig economy workers like Uber and Lyft drivers. It invests $150 billion directly in state and local governments and $100 billion in, national, in our national healthcare system, as well as billions in grants and loans and other programs for small businesses, including guaranteed loans for those businesses that don't lay off workers. I'm incredibly grateful for the time and the zeal that our congressional partners, especially Senators Durbin and Duckworth, dedicated 
to representing Illinois in these negotiations. This was a record-breaking emergency relief package and much needed for our state. As soon as Congress formally passes and President Trump signs this legislative package, my team and I will move as quickly as possible to bring every eligible dollar home to Illinois. In the meantime, we at the state level are continuing to do everything that we can to deliver our own emergency aid promptly and fairly. Finally, I just want to say that I know that there are people all across our state that are making real sacrifices by adhering to our stay-at-home order, which is in its fourth day. And I know that for those of you able to remain home, it feels like you've been there forever. I want to express my sincere gratitude to all of you. The sacrifices that you are making are saving lives, truly. I've also said a lot about the amazing work that our doctors and nurses and our first responders are doing. Taking a risk every day, going to work to protect us. But I also want to recognize our grocery store workers, our custodians, and our Metra and PACE and CTA workers, the factory workers who are producing essential medical equipment and the food on the grocery shelves, and the warehouse workers and truck drivers who make sure that our goods get to their destination. They are some of the unsung heroes in this fight, those who do the work behind the scenes to keep this state safely moving forward. And now I'd like to introduce our IDPH director, Dr. Ngazi Azik. Thank you, Governor, and thank you for all that the team is doing to help bridge Illinoisans as we get through this pandemic. These daily updates are critical in keeping Illinois informed. As difficult as it is to hear the news of more cases and deaths each day, I do believe sharing this information will keep us focused and remind us of why we all need to continue doing the right things. Doing the right thing will eventually lead us to these numbers decreasing and eventually ending this current pandemic. Today we are reporting 330 new cases, including three deaths. These are now affecting 35 counties across our, our state. Unfortunately, the pandemic in the United States and of course here in Illinois will get worse before it gets better. We understand that. We have seen Illinois cases in all ages, and we know we'll continue to see more cases in all settings. We've provided extensive guidance and are working tirelessly with these nursing home facilities on infection control practices, individual and group monitoring, isolation and quarantine, and health and medical care but we will see cases continue to grow, which is why it's so important that we all take action to reduce the number of people who are infected and shorten the duration of this pandemic. Many questions are asked about why some people are not able to get tested. Let's review the process. Again, it still starts with your clinician. The clinicians will evaluate you. That should start with a phone call. If you feel you need to talk to your doctor about your symptoms, call first. You can do a telehealth visit where you are explaining what your, what your temperature may be, what your symptoms are, um, and in fact, they may be compatible with COVID-19. Your clinician will assess your symptoms and based on the severity, they can determine whether it's even useful to test or not. The majority of people who don't have severe underlying conditions will probably not need to be tested and will not have a test recommended, but instead will be told to stay home. The guidance now is to stay home for at least seven days or 72 hours after your symptoms and fever abate, whichever is longer. But other considerations that may guide you to actually get testing are issues such as the occurrence of local community transmission in your jurisdiction. Clinicians are strongly encouraged to test for flu or other cases, other causes of respiratory illness. But the highest priority for testing of COVID-19 is for hospitalized patients and symptomatic healthcare workers. 
and patients with severe underlying conditions that make them highest risk for severe complications, including death. And the final priority is, of course, healthcare workers and first response and first responders, and the critical infrastructure workers who also are symptomatic. Again, you should not be tested in the absence of symptoms. No one is immune to this virus, not even if you are healthy, but not everyone necessarily needs a test. This virus is affecting every race and every ethnicity. Right now, we know of the counties that evolved, but we know that the number of counties will grow as well. Continue to stay home and continue to practice social distancing. Protect yourself, protect your loved ones, and protect your entire community by following these same instructions you've been hearing every day. Wash your hands for 20 seconds with soap. Cover your cough or sneeze. Stay home. Clean frequently touch services. Together, we are protecting all of Illinois and decreasing the number of fatalities from this extraordinary event. And now I will summarize the comments in Spanish. Estas reportes diarios son criticales para mantener informado al Estado. Los tomo muy en serio. Las noticias de más casos y muertes cada día son pesadas. Creo que compartiendo esta información nos ayudará a hacer las medidas por controlar el virus. Hoy estamos reportando 330 nuevos casos, incluyendo tres muertos en 35 condados de Illinois. La pandemia es en Estados Unidos y Illinois se pondrá malo antes de mejorar. Esa es la realidad. Vemos casos de COVID-19 en Illinois de todas ed edades. Veremos más casos en asilo de ancianos, incluyendo muertes. Vamos a ver casos en cárceles. Estamos trabajando con todas las poblaciones sobre prácticas de control de infecciones y atención médica. Pero vamos a ver casos en estos lugares. Por eso es tan importante que todos tomamos medidas para reducir la cantidad de personas infectadas y cortar la duración de esta pandemia. Los médicos tienen un proceso sobre quién debe hacerse la prueba. Si tienes síntomas graves y eres mayor de edad, se le hará una prueba. Si tienes síntomas baja y eres joven y sin muchos problemas médicos, debes quedarse en casa. Protégese, protege su familia y protege su comunidad. Juntos protegemos a Illinois. Thank you. And with that, I will turn it over to Treasurer Frerich. Thank you, Doctor. Good afternoon. First, I would like to commend Governor Pritzker for his leadership in this time of crisis. For more than two weeks, he stood before Illinois residents every day provide the latest updates in our battle against COVID-19, especially when the news itself might not have been comforting. Leadership is about making tough decisions and accepting responsibility. Thank you, Governor. Let me add thanks to the first responders and healthcare workers who are on the front lines of our efforts to contain the pandemic. We need to stay home so they can stay at work. And I wanna thank the grocery store workers the postal workers, delivery drivers, the men and women who continue to pick up our garbage and recycling, and all the people who are risking their health to keep performing the vital services that keep civilization going. They may not make the headlines, but they are doing the Lord's work just the same. When you see them, thank them. Next, I wanna thank the media. This is a difficult story to cover for many reasons. In presenting information to a certain segment of the public, more easily swayed by Facebook and social media is an incredibly daunting task. We are all concerned about the economy. For our workers and small business owners who have been displaced through no fault of their own, and for our efforts to create a soft landing so that we can push through this pandemic and return to a growing economy that lifts all boats. However, make no mistake, our decisions should be guided by medical experts and science 
not by television talking heads and Twitter posts. As the state treasurer, I'm the state's chief banking and investment officer. I want to thank my team, almost all of whom have been working remotely for the last 10 days. Our state investment portfolio is about $14 billion, about the same amount it was late last year when news of the virus began emerging. The amount is the same because state law prohibits investing any portion of the $14 billion state portfolio in the stock market. Let me repeat that. State law prohibits investing any portion of our state portfolio in the stock market. We have taken steps to reduce volatility, preserve capital, and maintain liquidity in our state portfolio. This includes reducing the average length of our investments. For our small business owners and workers, the State Treasurer's Office has launched a bridge loan program to help them push through these uncertain times. We have made $250 million available to banks and credit unions across our state at an historically low interest rate of almost zero. We agreed to deposit a quarter of a billion dollars from the state portfolio in increments of one or five million dollars with financial institutions across the state. In turn, they have agreed to turn around and use the money to help small businesses and nonprofits pay rent, purchase supplies, and to make payroll. Our goal is simple. We understand businesses slowed. We do not want businesses to close forever. We want them to be able to make payroll and pay their own bills. It is easier to ramp up a business that is struggling than a business that has shuttered. If your business or nonprofit is interested, please contact your bank or credit union and ask them if they are participating in the state treasurer's program. On a smaller scale, last week my team issued emergency rules for our unclaimed property division. We raised the ceiling for our fast track program from $500 to $2,000. As a result, we've been able to push out nearly $3 million in additional unclaimed property to more than 3,000 people across our state in just the last week. This is their money that will help them to pay the rent, buy groceries, or pay the gas bill. Finally, we have rolled over $200 million in investment notes or loans the state comptroller to pay medical bills. My office could invest up to $2 billion in the state of Illinois' bill backlog at a reduced market-based rate as opposed to the 9 or 12% late payment interest rate penalty. During this time of need, this authority not only saves money, it gets more cash out the door to our health care providers. We are continuing our discussions with the comptroller and the governor's office of management and budget about ways to support the state's cash flow using the legal tools we already have. We are just beginning to learn what is coming out of Congress. And I'm glad to hear that the legislation may include efforts to assist state and local governments, including $150 billion in appropriations and some increased flexibility for the Federal Reserve to provide assistance. But I fear it may not be enough if we do not listen to the medical experts. COVID-19 is serious business. It preys on us all. What it does not do is differentiate between liberals and conservatives, Republicans or Democrats, or Chicago or downstate residents. We will all be better off if we remember that. I would like to now turn it over to the president of the Illinois Hotel and Lodging Association, Michael Jacobson. Thank you, Treasurer. I would also like to applaud Governor Pritzker for his incredible leadership over the past several weeks as it relates to COVID-19. Hotels throughout Illinois are among the most impacted industries when it comes to economic decline over the past month. Hotel properties that were originally projecting to have an occupancy rate in the 70% range are now in the teens or even single digits. The damage is worse than the impacts of 9-11 and the 2008 recession combined. Unfortunately, with that level of decline, there is a human impact when it comes to the tens of thousands of layoffs that we've seen in our industry in just the past several days. We expect that number to hit more than 120,000 total layoffs in the coming weeks. Small businesses that operate our hotels are hurting, 
and deciding every day whether or not to close their hotels altogether. Our employees are hurting and hoping that they can just keep their job. That is why we commend the governor for announcing this new fund dedicated to providing grants to small hotel owners in an effort to retain as many staff as possible. These relief funds will provide critical resources to hoteliers to avoid as many layoffs as possible at their property. I encourage any small hotel owner to explore their eligibility and apply online at coronavirus.illinois.gov. As the governor mentioned, that application process is now posted online and hotel owners can explore their eligibility as of today at coronavirus.illinois.gov. We know that our work is not complete yet and we have a lot of work cut out for us, especially as we look at the long-term recovery. But this is an important first step in trying to save our industry, who historically is one of the most significant economic engines, employers, and tax generators for the state of Illinois. Separately, I also wanted to thank the Illinois Emergency Management Agency for their partnership in recent weeks to pair Illinois hotels who have volunteered their properties to be used for emergency housing during the COVID-19 crisis with local health departments. So far already, we have identified nearly 20,000 rooms throughout the state to be used for housing for healthcare workers, first responders, and hospital overflow. I am truly honored and humbled to represent an industry that is all about people helping people, and that's during normal times. That couldn't be more the case right now. Our hoteliers throughout the state of Illinois have stepped up and answered the call of duty in a time of crisis to open their doors to some of the most vulnerable and at-risk citizens in our state. Governor, thank you for your understanding of the role that hotels and tourism play in our emergency response as well as our state's economy. We stand ready to continue the work ahead with your team to continue the recovery from these unprecedented times. I'll now throw it back to Governor Pritzker for a question and answer. Thank you very much, Michael. And just before I begin, I want uh, some of you, all of you, to recognize uh, somebody who has been here nearly every day, uh, someone who does an invaluable service for all of us. Um, he occasionally gets a reprieve, as he has just now. But, uh, but I want you all to know that uh, Michael Albert, who has been uh, providing a sign language interpretation for us, uh, is somebody that we've relied upon to help us get a message out to people all across our state, and he's invaluable to all of us. So, Michael, thank you for everything that you do. And not to uh, uh, forget that, that you occasionally have somebody who helped you out. Thank you very much for all that you do and all of the others who have provided substitute services um, for every day when Michael is gets a little bit tired. Uh, some of us are verbose, so, uh, so he... Uh, you know, he's uh, hardworking and, um, and I'm sure that this is a lot of exercise for anybody. Uh, so thank you very much and I'm um, happy to take any questions from people who are in the room, the reporters, and then of course those who are online. Governor, can you give us an update on what's being done at the penal institutions across the state and the county? How are they doing social distancing and, mm -hmm. and, and making sure they're sanitized? Yep, so um, we've made sure that across our uh, prisons, um, in particular, that uh, we're uh, making space. You know, one of the challenges here is that you may have people who get sick either from COVID-19 or something else, and you want to make sure that there aren't any underlying conditions that people are going through putting aside COVID-19, so that if someone were to catch COVID-19, they're not, uh, you know, experiencing comorbidity. So finding space in a, you know, small environment, right, like a uh, prison um, is very critical. That's what our director of the Department of Corrections has been working hard to do. Um, and I talked a little bit about our efforts to try to make, you know, to provide space in some of these places by looking at low level offenders and um, the opportunity for us to release some people who may be through most of their uh, term. Uh, because that, again, anybody that we can uh, remove from that space gives us just a little more room to have recovery areas for people who might be sick within our prison system. Mm. Yes, sir. Are there, uh, Governor, are there spending priorities or programs that are going to have to be sort of pushed back because of the tax deadline being pushed to 
uh, July 15th. And then if I may, a question about PPE. There are reports that, that are some states um, are receiving PPE from the federal government that's expired. Has Illinois received expired PPE? And what do you say to the healthcare workers who have to maybe use that stuff? Yeah, um, let's see, uh, I'll start with, um, with uh, the programs you asked about, you know, do we have to uh, put off programs because of uh, challenges in revenue? Um, the answer is nothing that is a vital service, a critical service for people across the state will be put off. In fact, they've been significantly enhanced, I would say, across the board, you know, making sure that we're providing more uh, resources for those who are homeless, making sure that we're providing food for people who are, you know, kids in particular, but families where the kids aren't able to go to school now and so they need meals during the day and frankly, some of them were getting breakfast and lunch at school, so we're providing uh, meals across the state and funding for that. Uh, so there's a lot that's going on and I would say nobody should be suffering from a lack of service. Mind you, as you know, there are state employees who are at home. We have a lower staff level uh, in many agencies, but on the front lines, people who are serving those who are developmentally disabled, for example, or providing substance abuse treatment, um, for the most part, we are staffing that as we think appropriate and we think will serve people who badly need those services. On the PPE question, um, all PPE, you want me to? I can help you with okay, go ahead. I, so, I, I mean, I think we should just be clear that we're not trying to put any of our first responders, our healthcare workers, um, we're not trying to put anybody at risk. There is a program, uh, the Shelf Life Extension Program, by which the, you know, each, all of the PPE is obviously clearly documented and there are, you know, lot numbers. And so the Shelf Life Extension Program goes through each lot number of the equipment and then has a group of people who will do tests to see if that equipment is still functional. And if in fact the lot number has been checked, that means that all of the equipment that was made under that same batch is now been extended in terms of its use. This was done in the H1N1. This is done as a, as a routine. So if we have been given expired, uh, what on the box maybe it was expired, it has already undergone testing and been approved to have its uh, life extended. So everything that, that you've received, there's no concern. What you're getting from the federal government is usable at this point. That's correct. Right. Right, and I would add that we, as you know, as I, I think I talked about yesterday, or the day before rather, um, we're acquiring new PPE all the time now, and so there's a significant amount of new PPE that's come in, things that have been manufactured just in the recent past, because as I think I pointed out to you, we really haven't received all that much PPE from the federal government. Mm -hmm. Governor, the one other, more question in the room. Yeah, you mentioned that there was an upgrade done to the unemployment <laughs> filing system, and yet we're getting more than a dozen emails every single day yeah. from people saying it's still a complete mess. They're getting error messages all the time. They can't get through. I mean, it doesn't sound like enough has been done. That Well, enough, enough hasn't been done. You're 100% right. Um, again, this is, as I've said, this is an unprecedented number of people who are applying at the same time. And um, our do it, our Department of Innovation Technology, um, our state CIO, have been on this every day. They're trying very hard to expand availability. They are expanding the availability, but uh, it is true that we remain overloaded. People are gonna have to be patient, at least for now. Over the course of this week, those changes are coming online. I can't guarantee that it's going to be easy for everybody who gets there, uh, especially if people show up all at the same time during work hours, for example. But you can go online any time of day or night and so I would suggest to people that perhaps finding off hours to go online to make that filing uh, will be much easier for you and easier on the system. So, you know, hang with us here. We're gonna make changes that are making it better, but it is true. It's not working the way that I want it to either. Okay, we've gotta to go to some questions online. Um, Dr. Azike, why is the recommendation to stay home for only seven days or 72 hours after an illness or symptoms are alleviated when we've heard the virus is contagious and can for 14 days. Yeah. So we are following CDC's guidance as we get more information globally about this virus and its transmissibility that allows us to be able to narrow. The original 14 days was just put out there understanding how maybe other viruses have worked but as we've gotten more information and been able to do the contact tracing for those some of those earlier cases it's become more clear when people are actually transmitting the virus. 
Do we know how much Illinois and local governments in the state will get from the congressional stimulus bill? We don't yet know. I mean, let me add to everybody that that bill hasn't actually passed. There was a negotiation. There's an agreement. Uh, we believe that it will pass the Senate and the House and get signed by the uh, president, but we don't exactly know. Um, the bill is being read and evaluated by uh, really everybody uh, around the country, but particularly by our uh, federal director and our federal representatives uh, to determine what we might get in the state. A lot of this is uh, population based, I should say. And so, you know, Illinois being the sixth most populous state in the United States, it allows us to get a larger percentage than many other states. Another question for Dr. ZK, are we seeing multiple deaths in families also still just one death at the DuPage County long-term care facility? So yes, I'm aware of uh, one death at the DuPage facility. And we have seen definitely uh, clusters of, of infection in, in families. Obviously we know household contacts are the most at risk in terms of who's likely to catch it after the first confirmed case. And so unfortunately, I'm not able to know the details of every single fatality, um, but we are investigating specific outbreaks and clusters and we'll have that information that will be put on our website as we look at that very seriously. I've heard from people confused by the state's stay-at-home rules as contrasted with CDC policy, which doesn't go that far. Can you clarify if people should rely on the state or CDC? People should rely on the stay-at-home order that we put in place. Um, the CDC has continuously kind of lagged behind the states. Um, we are relying upon epidemiologists, some of the best in the world, frankly, on our great public health director uh, and her staff and on the statisticians and those who are modelers. Um, and we're doing what we think is right and believe that this is a very effective way for us to diminish the spread of COVID-19. Um, CDC has some terrific scientists and medical doctors as well, um, but their guidance really has been kind of a one size fits all. In other words, you might have a state that is vastly rural with very, very few people that are in uh, towns or cities uh, in that state. Uh, and a small state might have different guidance than a larger state. Uh, so, you know, we're doing what, what is best for people in the state of Illinois. How are all of you holding up in this? Yesterday it sounded like the situation was wearing on some of you. <laughs> Not sure which of us they're talking about. Huh? <laughs> Uh, we're, we're all holding up just fine. Thank you for whoever gave that question and who cares uh, about uh, everybody who's standing here and also my staff who are working uh, long hours. We all are, but my staff especially, I'm, I'm so grateful to because uh, it really they're getting here early in the morning. They're here late, late at night. Um, they're solving problems for people all across the state and uh, giving of themselves in ways that I don't think anybody imagined that they would need to when they uh, went into public service. So I'm grateful to them and everybody seems to be doing just fine. We're also making sure that they're healthy, um, giving them you know room to stay at home uh, for many of them, uh, but we've got some core staff who are here just all the time. Those who are at home, I might add, are working nonstop nevertheless. So um, I'm grateful to them as well. Governor, can we ask that question of Dr. Ezekiel? I think, was, I think the question might have been from yesterday. I just, I, I noticed when, when she was giving the figures yesterday on the deaths and the numbers that went up. I could sense there was some real emotion. And I can see this is, seems to be, you know, you, you obviously you're a doctor, you care. Yeah, no, I mean, it, it, is, it is hard. I'm a doctor, I'm a mother, and I just buried my father last month. And so when I think about people who can't do what I did for my father last month, I feel it very real as to what people are going through and the sacrifices that they're making. I think for, for all of us, I'll just add that for all of us, I think I have um, a friend who I spoke with today whose um, who's, uh, wife and children all, all have fevers, um, all uh, are experiencing some symptoms. They're staying at home. Uh, they're um, on their way, I hope, to recovery. Uh, but as you can imagine, my friend's concern for his family was great. Um, so, you know, all of us, I think, are um, aware of how serious this situation is and are touched by somebody, somebody 
at work, somebody at home, somebody in your life, uh, no doubt you know uh, that uh, has contracted this or is affected by it. So um, I appreciate the concern by whoever asked that question. And this will be the final question for today. There's been a fair amount of back and forth with the White House over PPE. Are you concerned that President Trump will play politics and not send shipments to Illinois as a result? Uh, I, I would hope not. Um, I, I, I really would hope not. I, uh, you know, I'm talking, I'm working with the professionals that the Army Corps of Engineers, with, you know, I spoke with the Secretary of the Army yesterday, the Secretary of Defense. So many people are working hard to help us address the challenges that we have as a result of COVID-19. Um, and so, you know, my expectation is that uh, people at the federal government level want to do the right thing. So we're continuing to protect the people of the state of Illinois, and I'm gonna do whatever it takes, frankly, to get that job done. Uh, and sometimes when I have to be critical in order to get something done, I'm gonna be doing that. Uh, you'll hear me do that, but, uh, but I am not somebody who normally, um, you know, uh, likes to, to um, you know, uh, take on a confrontation if I don't need to, but I will, um, and especially on something this serious. Have you been able to get PPE from Chinese manufacturers? Because I know that's been, they've got a lot of PPE obviously in China. The federal government's had trouble. Are the states having better luck in terms of PPE from China? There is a big challenge. I mean, you know, it's the relationship between President Trump and the Chinese government has not been good. Um, uh, and uh, so there's actually been um, over the course of this process over the last few weeks, there are challenges getting things out of China. Um, and as you know, that's where a lot of PPE is manufactured. So, um, uh, yeah, we're, you know, we're overcoming those challenges wherever we need to and acquiring PPE really from anywhere that we can. There are manufacturers here in the United States, and as you heard me the other day, there are manufacturers here in the state of Illinois that we're acquiring from. So, um, you know, it's, it's coming in. It's not as fast as I would like. I'd rather the federal government was, uh, had taken this over and doing it uh, themselves for everybody. But, you know, we're, we're getting the job done. Thank, Thank you, everyone. You.